Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about what I'm going to be talking about within today's stream. So first of all, I'll be giving you guys an early modern um, period overview, a kind of an objective overview of what was going on to kind of set the stage for this maritime empire revolution, the empires of the wind. And then we'll be talking about the impetus for global expansion and trade because this didn't come out of nowhere. There was a lot of things leading up to the global expansion and trade that occurred during these maritime empires. Um, and then we also have the emergence of maritime empires. I'll be talking about kind of the history of what was going on during this period and the main maritime empires to know. Um, and then the long-term effects of this period because they're hefty. There's a lot of long-term effects of this period that you can learn from, that you can really use on SAQ questions, multiple choice questions and LEQ questions on the AP examination because the continuity is part of it in AP World History and Modern is, is huge. And I think if you guys really focus on the effects, you can benefit a lot in the AP World History curriculum. And then after that, we'll be talking about some document analysis and written practice. We'll be having an SAQ first to lead it off, and then uh, three multiple choice questions as curated by our um, head in AP World History, um, Eric Beckman. So again, as Eric Beckman said, feel free to check out the poll in today's stream because I've posted two questions talking about your own experiences with Fivable and your experiences um, as an AP student in uh, the curriculum. And then lastly, we'll having a Q&A period, which is kind of where I'll answer any of your questions um, with regard to what the AP World course is, some studying tips, and just uh, content um, related information. Okay, so let's talk about an introduction. So first of all, I would like you guys to answer in the comments section, um, what is a maritime empire? I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer this question here. Anything you know about maritime empires, leave it in the comments section. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys. So anything at all about maritime empires? All right, I'll give you guys a few more minutes. If you don't feel like talking, that's all right, but I would really encourage you to um, be active in this session because being active in class, being active in lectures can really help you guys out um, in the long run. So definitely give you guys a few minutes, but uh, try to put any of your input. So Aaron Bruce just said, empires that consist of small pieces of land that are separated by large bodies of water. Um, in essence, this is true. Um, and then Pritham Patel said, empires that control trade and the production, not the people and territory. Um, so going back to what Aaron Bruce Sex said, um, they do consist of small pieces of land in some cases, but they're also separated by large bodies of water. Because again, we're talking about maritime empires that are spread out over very, very large pieces of land. And as Pratham said, um, they control trade and production because the main focus of these maritime empires is to control trade. And that's why they have such extensive empires because they have many, many, many people integrated within the empire with regards to trade and things like that. Um, they do control people and territory in some cases, but uh, the main focus of the maritime empires is upon trade. Um, anything else, you guys? All right. So next, we have another question. Um, can you guys name any maritime empires that first come to mind from this period or the last period um, or future periods? Just any maritime empires that can provide a good example for us here today. And I'm very glad that you guys answered these questions because it gives me some points to talk off of. Um, and it gives me some points to kind of help you guys with regard to your own knowledge of maritime empires before we start this session. So anything about um, some old maritime empires, new maritime empires, maritime empires that we see during this period, just let, um, yeah, don't be shy. I mean, answer the questions in the comment section because it can really help you if you kind of name these empires and, you know, be interactive. All right, a few more seconds, you guys. Um, any maritime empires, feel free to guess. I mean, if you're wrong, you're wrong. It's okay. Um, that's what we're here for. We're teaching you about maritime empires, so don't be afraid if you're wrong.
Spain. Um, so yes, Paige, that's a very, very great example. And I see you, Pratham, answering to the Portuguese. Um, we're going to be highlighting both of these empires during our stream here today. Um, and the Spanish were one of the biggest uh, maritime empires later on, um, before they were eclipsed, eclipsed by the English, of course. But the Portuguese were very the pioneers of the maritime empires. Um, and you won't ever need to know all of them. Uh, again, as as we said, but uh, be able to generate one or two examples as you guys have. The Portuguese and Spanish are great, great, great examples because the Portuguese are pioneers. The Spanish are continuous. Um, so I think those are great examples, you, you guys. And um, I applaud you for making an attempt. And that's some great examples. So let's talk about gunpowder empires, first of all. So gunpowder empires are what we call these land empires. And they really extend their role, their control over ethnically diverse populations because again, these are land empires. They're conquering territory much like the Roman Empire, these old empires like the Mesopotamian Empire. And they have very ethnically diverse populations because they just eclipse so many religions and so much territory. They also need large militaries and navies to kind of accommodate this territory and to continuously maintain this territory, which costs a lot of money. And that's what really characterizes these gunpowder empires. We also see gunpowder empires be defended, uh, dependent upon native collaborators um, and extend their rule as a traditional empire, because as we see with the Romans and the Persians of the past periods, um, they really re rely upon native commanders and these native people to kind of expand their rule and not have direct rule, like third party rule. Um, and we also see advanced military technologies as we can compare with advanced maritime technologies with these new maritime empires. So with these huge, huge, huge maritime empires, they control trade via the connection and jurisdiction of limited ports. So much like the Portuguese and Spanish, they have very, very big trade ports across their empire, which really connect different parts of the world world into a big consolidated territory, territorial realm. And we also have to colonize limited territory because with these gunpowder empires are all about colonizing territory. And these maritime empires are not so much about that. They're more about enticing trade and things like this. And then we also have advanced maritime technologies as compared with advanced military technologies because these gunpowder empires, they're really, really focused upon um, making their ships bigger making their uh, navigation systems better, making the max more accurate. So that's what really bolsters them and helps their trade during this period. So characterize these gunpowder empires by land, by diverse populations, large militaries and advanced military technologies, and native collaborators. And just these maritime empires by maritime technologies, and limited territory, and just trade, trade, trade. That's your big focus here, these trading ports. And we'll talk much more about this later on. So a few big examples um, of the early modern period. First of all, we have the Renaissance, um, kind of a basic overview of this period. Um, the Renaissance was occurring during this period, and this was bolstered by European discoveries during the now notorious Crusades. Because during this Crusades period, as I'm sure you guys have learned about in your AP World History course, the Europeans were exposed to a lot of their old technologies and their old scriptures that were kept by the uh, Middle Eastern peoples. And so the Renaissance began as a heavily, heavily focused um, period that focused upon the old discoveries of the Europeans and also upon personal achievement. And then we have the Reformation. Um, so the Catholic Church was very, very power hungry during this period and they were getting headstrong kind of, um, and they actually had things like the uh, very, very corrupt things. And so Martin Luther listed forth major grievances in his 95 theses um, against the Roman Catholic Church, which inspired the rise of Protestantism in areas like France, England, and Germany. So um, religion was really, really diversified during this period because of these, the rise of Protestant sects um, like Lutheranism, um, like Calvinism, and just different, different sects that were different from the normal Christianity and that stressed the Bible over everything else. And it often stressed the Roman Catholic Church as kind of subsidiary, not as the main thing that spread Christianity. And then we have the scientific revolution because um, spread by the discoveries of scientists like Copernicus and Galileo, we have many, many scientists go against the norm of the Roman Catholic Church through inductive reasoning and the scientific method. And then the last revolution during this period is the Enlightenment. Um, a new social order. So philosophers like John Locke, like John Jacques Rousseau, they kind of established the idea of a social contract in light of resentment towards the federal government. And because of this social contract idea, the government's become much, much more accommodating for the people and they help the people out. So all you need to know about this period is many, many revolutions in ideological thought and the physical actions of governments, um, of scientists, of religion, of the church, and of artists and artisans. So first of all, let's kind of review um, a stimulus here today. Um, I want you guys to kind of analyze this prompt. So Fort Jesus, this is a picture of Fort Jesus, Mombasa, East Africa, titled Book of the Plans of All the Fortresses, Cities, and Towns of the State of East India. 
Antonio Bocaro, Portuguese chronicle and, ex and geographer, uh, 1665, intended for the King of Spain and Portugal, which again, their crowns really connected during this period. Um, if you guys can look at the look at the little fort diagram that we've, we've listed here today and also the label that we have for the stimulus and list out some of the things you guys see with regard to hippo analysis, um, the historical importance, the um, the individual importance, the purpose and the point of view. So, you know, the context on um, just the purpose and how the author is trying to use this document. So uh, please list out what you guys think about this fort. Anything you notice about the prompt, important things you guys notice. So historical context, intended uh, intended audience, uh, purpose, and point of view. Um, list out what you guys know about this, and then we'll go from there. All right, y'all. So for historical importance, um, the Portuguese trading post empire was really, really, really huge during this period. And you can see that they're establishing plans of fortresses, cities, and towns in the state of East India. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, very great as we're seeing during this period. Um, Mongbaka was off that, and it's just a great um, example of Portuguese trading post empire, which was preeminent during this period. Um, and again, as Mr. Giorgio said, the prompt is a Eurocentric point of view. Um, and that's what we're talking about, intended audience. So the intended audience here is clearly for the King of Spain and Portugal. And it's a Eurocentric point of view towards this because the natives might not have viewed the sport as um, as this big, as this glorious, and as this uh, you know, colorful. And so it's kind of a more Eurocentric point of view as how the forts were and how they looked and how they're supposed to um, you know, have the platform for their functioning. And then point of view and purpose are kind of relevant with this. They're kind of intended to, um, you know, display Portuguese dominance of the kings of Spain and Portugal. And the point of view was from a guy who really respected the Portuguese expansion and trade during this period. And then this next prompt is actually um, the city walls at Malacca or Ma Malacca in uh, the eastern, the Indian Sea at 1604, drawn by Manuel Godinho de Heredia, a mainly Portuguese writer and geographer. And as you can see here, again, it's a Eurocentric point of view because it's a Portuguese writer and geographer. And I think this document as well may have been intended for a royal audience. We don't know that for sure, but we do see many, many remnants of Portuguese nationalism and things like this because the Portuguese fort is very, very heavily laid out as a royal faction and also as a place for cultural dispersion, which is true of these Portuguese forts. So what was occurring during this period, um, as Mr. Beckman said, to get an idea of the African point of view, the Swahili word for prison derives from the Portuguese word for church. So the Africans, especially the, the Moluccans, um, they just hated the Portuguese forts because they were just impeding upon their culture, impeding upon the trade, um, and putting up taxes for their own goods. So I feel like it'd be much, much more different from an African point of view, and definitely would have been. But these forts are something that the Portuguese prided and they believed to be something of them spreading their own culture, their own religion, their Roman Catholicism. And then we'll talk about a little bit of gunpowder empires that dabble in the age of exploration. Uh, so the Ottoman Portuguese competition in the Indian Ocean. So as you know, the Ottomans are a gunpowder empire. They're a land-based empire. And the Portuguese are a maritime empire, um, as you mentioned before when you all mentioned. Um, so the Portuguese have much, much more maritime um, trading post, uh, trading posts across the region and much more, more coastal cities to kind of facilitate this dispersion um, of the realm. Uh, and we see we see many, many, many elements of cultural transfusion during this period. And the Ottomans were much, much more secluded on their landmass and had less trading ports. So as you can see, the Ottomans did have a good navy. They did do some of these trading um, post-empire kind of things, but the Portuguese were much, much more involved, as were many maritime empires. So um, let's go into the main basics of the maritime empires, the impetus for global expansion and trade. So as for centuries, for centuries, the Europeans and Asians have been trading through Arab middlemen. And these Arab middlemen, as you can see, were spiking up prices because for Europeans to transport goods to Asia, which wasn't that important, they, they were spiking up prices. And for Asians to kind of transport goods to the Europeans, their goods would, be, would cost more because the Arab middlemen was spiking up prices to kind of get a royalty off them, as many companies do in today's world. So to get rid of these Arab middlemen, the Europeans actually wanted to have a direct route to Asia, and they ended up finding one through the Portuguese, which pioneered this kind of period. 
And the impetus for this global expansion and the, the way that this was made possible was through adopted advancements and truly uh, fueled transoceanic travel and facilitated the rise of maritime empires. And a huge, huge, huge amount of technological discoveries helped this happen. So first we see a three-masted caravel. If you don't know what that is, um, they're actually uh, ships, big ships um, that are swift and hefty, which use lateen sails. And lateen sails are highly maneuverable sails that allow ships to deliver provisions to different lands because they're very highly maneuverable and they allow the ships to use the wind, use the monsoon season to really jumpstart their own status. Um, and so as we're seeing in the comments section, let's go back to the Strait of Malacca. Um, you know, the, the pirates are very, very common during this, uh, within this strait, uh, as Mr. Giorgio and Mr. Beckman are talking about here. Uh, but back to this point about technologies. We see the three-masted caravel again, um, which is allows for navigation and the transportation of provisions. And we see the astrolabes. The astrolabe was a technology developed way, way back when in the Hellenic world by the Greeks. It was a navigational advice that allowed sailors to accurately determine their latitude um, by stargazing. And it determined their latitude by looking at their distance between themselves and the stars high up above. And it was almost like a little, you know, a cylindrical thing where you could kind of uh, spin to find out where your location was in terms of latitude and, and things like that. This. So the astrolabe was a very, very uh, determinant tool. We're talking about latitude. We're talking about where you were in relation to these empires. The magnetic compass. So we see drifting into the hands of Europeans through extensive Eurasian trade. The magnetic compass allowed traders to determine direction regardless of their distance from land. So the magnetic compass was developed in China, and it really allowed for Europeans to kind of bolster their trade. And I see a problem asked the question, what were some technological advancements in the Qing dynasty? Now that comes very, very later on, but uh, if I do remember right, the Qing dynasty were very, very heavy on paper making, they were heavy on poem making, which aren't generally technological advancements, but they did have some, which we'll talk about later on. But right now we're talking about the magnetic compass that wasn't developed under the Qing, but it was in China. And a lot of these technologies we're talking about, uh, paper making was developed in China, which led to better map making. Uh, magnetic compass was, was developed in China, which allowed for um, much better navigation during this period. And I do believe that we have the stern post rudder developed in China, which acted as a tool for navigation and um, the steering of ships during this period. Uh, so we also have the Volto do Mar. So the Portuguese actually created a, um, a tool called the Volto do Mar. And it wasn't really a technology, but it did allow for the navigation of the, um, the monsoon seasons around Africa and around Asia, because the Volto do Mar was kind of a route that allowed for um, the Portuguese to capitalize upon these winds and to use them for navigation to capitalize and advantage them. And we see the stern post rudder, as you were saying, um, for Pratham, the there was developed in China, and it was kind of an additive supplement to ships, which allowed for them to steer better. And then we have Johannes Gutenberg's printing press, which allows for the efficient dissemination of information, especially European maps and Asian maps. Um, this was kind of a uh, successor of the Chinese paper making system, um, and it was a very, very essential tool. And again, as Mr. Beckman said, the Qing can be considered one of the gunpowder empires. So because um, and we'll talk about this later on, but the Ming Dynasty was kind of making a dabble into oceanic travel as a maritime empire. But as time passed, the Ming Dynasty fell to the Qing rulers, but the Qing didn't really want to expand the rule over the maritime realm because the Confucian people were against it and it just was an overextension of their power and they wanted to remain in lands. Um, and also they were very having a hard time with trade and people from Europe trying to take their land. Um, and they did create a lot of gunpowder weapons, as Mr. Breckman was saying. But yes, we had many, they actually emphasized poems, they emphasized the arts, and that was one of their main things as a gunpowder empire, uh, to answer your question. But the main advancements during this period were kind of limited to maritime advancements, um, especially as these empires in Asia and in Europe tried to find a way to deliver their goods past the Arab middlemen and between these continents. So let's talk about the historical emergence of maritime empires. So from 1450 to 1550 CE, first of all, we see uh, 1304 to 1410 CE, we see the Sultanate of Malacca or Malacca was established, integrating a center for international trade with, that was heavily aligned with the Ming Dynasty. So as we were saying before, the Malacca Strait was heavily involved with um, pirates. There was a lot of piracy on this strait, but they were also very involved with the Ming Dynasty because they were one of the tributary states of the Ming dynasty and they offered tribute in the form of taxes to this dynasty. And that meant there was a lot of trade going on between the Strait of Malacca, which was kind of downwards in the Indian Ocean and also the Ming dynasty in China. 
And we see from 1360 to 1460 CE, the Prince Henry the Navigator. That's a name to know in the terms of maritime empires because Prince Henry the Navigator was actually a prince who was not a king um, for the, uh, the country of Portugal and he established a heavy school of navigation an astronomical observatory with his own money in Sagres, Portugal. And because of this, uh, he actually trained the next generation of map makers, next generation of astronomers, and next generation of sailors and navigators, which made Portugal the prime time region, the prime time um, country to kind of bolster your own knowledge um, in you know, these kinds of technologies and to really bolster the trade going forth. We also see from 1380 to 1620 CE, um, the Hanseatic League served to expand the merchant class and to spread the concept of merc mercantilism across Europe. Now, the Hanseatic League, if you guys don't know, is kind of a loosely tied connection of German states and German nationalities of middle class people. And these people are really, really merchant, merchant based, they're merchant centric, and these towns were really um, stressing the importance of merchants. And that's why mercantilism became a very, very central thing later on, partly because of the Hanseatic League and um, their prominence during this period. And we see in 1390 CE, um, Africa starts to make a play. The Congo Empire formed as a heavily organized, self-sufficient imperial territory in Africa and aligned itself with the Portuguese and other European entities to profit from the slave trade. So you can see many, many empires, including the Ashanti Kingdom and the Congo Kingdom, really try to profit upon the slave trade during this period and align themselves with many European empires which wanted slaves. And lastly, we also see from 1400 to 1430 CE, Zheng He's voyages. Um, so when we're talking about the Qing Dynasty, the predecessor of the Qing Dynasty was actually the Ming Dynasty. And the Ming Dynasty was actually the successor um, of the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty was a Mongol-led dynasty, which kind of curbed Chinese influence and kept the Chinese from ruling their own realm. Um, and though it did a lot of good for China, it also destroyed Chinese culture. And that's why the Ming Dynasty tried to um, ensure this dominance of this culture by sending people like Zheng He to kind of reinstate their maritime might. And Zheng He used thousands of Chinese junks to spread the news of the Yongli Emperor's ascension and to really garner tributary states for China um, and to lead um, the Ming Dynasty as an early maritime empire, which kind of disseminated because we can see later on that the Confucian scholars didn't like what the Yongle Emperor was doing with the maritime empire root of the, um, the Ming dynasty. And because of the Confucian Emperor's descent, uh, we see the Yongle Emperor kind of take back efforts from Zheng He to establish this empire. And because of this, the Qing dynasty and the later Ming dynasty becomes heavily gunpowder related and defensive. They didn't conquer much territory um, from a maritime perspective. Okay, some later involvements from in 1492 CE we see Christopher Columbus, who's a very, very good name in world history and just history in general, because Christopher Columbus's accidental voyage to South America spurred future westward exploration and heavily influenced the development of maritime empires. Because if you're thinking about it, Christopher Columbus opened this huge, huge, huge place, this huge, huge, huge country, territory, whatever you want to call it, of land. And this huge place of land was a perfect situation for these European territories, these Asian territories to kind of put their flag in and develop their maritime empires more so and to get their taxes from these peoples. We also see in 1530 CE, the Mughal Empire was established, which provided a means for European maritime traders to procure valuable wines and spices. And the Mughal Empire was not a maritime empire, but it did kind of provide an impetus for maritime empires to form because they had valuable spices and valuable um, Islamist handmade crafts and things like this. So it leads to the formation of joint stock companies like the British East India Company and the Dutch VOC, uh, two names to remember. Um, and they really, really, you know, were involved in India and in this Mughal Empire trade. And lastly, in 1550 CE, the British Empire began to take shape as the idea of mercantilism um, led entities as such into expanding their maritime reach. Because before this, the British Empire was kind of a, first of all, a gunpowder empire, and second of all, an empire that didn't really want to expand mercantilism. It wasn't a very influential empire. And if you know anything about the British Empire, after 1550 CE, they went into a huge Elizabethan age of maritime expansion, of land expansion, and just expansion in general. 
So some later advancements in the emergence of maritime empires from 1550 to 1650 CE. Um, in 1560 CE, we actually see the beginning of the Elizabethan age right after this English resurgence. And the Elizabethan age was a period in which the British experienced a virtual re revival in the arts, kind of like a renaissance for just the British. And they just have a lot of really influential artwork and really influential books and pamphlets during this period. Um, we also see Queen Elizabeth I work to colonize territories elsewhere. Um, she colonizes territories in the New World through expeditions with the Plymouth Colony and things like this later on. But just know the Elizabethan age from 1560C was the beginning of all of this. And then next we have in 1580 CE, the Protestant Dutch provinces declare their independence from Spain. And this pro this really creates the Dutch um, the Dutch Empire. And the Dutch Empire was very, very essential and they were very, very prominent because the Dutch Empire kind of stressed um, the imperial reign of territories through a maritime empire, and they really had a lot of trading posts, just like the Portuguese, and they established their own trading posts in New Amsterdam. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, but the basics is, in 1580 CE, the Protestant Dutch provinces declared their independence and established a huge trading post empire. In 1590 CE, this is a very, very essential year in the uh, realm of AP world history and AP Euro, because Queen Elizabeth I defeated the Spanish Armada in this year. Um, and because of this defeat of the Spanish Armada, the English Navy was the number one maritime empire um, kind of in the world at this point. And because of this, England became very, very expedited. They were able to sponsor voyages into India, into other realms, into Asia, into the New World, and just to sponsor the development of territories and spheres of influence across these different realms. So 1590 CE is almost as important as the Elizabethan age just because the Spanish Armada and this invasion. Um, 1600 CE is called the beginning of the Edo period or the Tokugawa Shogunate. Uh, because before this period, the Japanese were kind of making very, very heavy advances um, into becoming a prominent westernized empire. But a guy named Tokugawa Ayesu established his shogunate in Japan. And he saw the influence of European colonization and Christianity. And they had, he heavily worked to seclude Japan from all Western influence, especially against the spread of Christian faith. And the only port that was allowed for Christian influence or any European influence was actually was Canton. And Canton was allowed for Dutch influence because the Dutch were kind of hands off in the strategy towards China, um, unlike the British and the French and the Spanish. But you can see these kind of empires because during this period, we see a lot of maritime expansion, a lot of just cultural spread and cultural connection connections, but um, because of this 1600 CE, Japan was completely secluded. Um, a positive of this was they developed their own unique culture, but the negative was they were kind of taken off from these maritime empires, and the maritime empire was not able to uh, connect with Japan. Japan was kind of secluded. They didn't have westernized economy after this. And in 1640 CE, we see the tyr tyrannical rule of Charles I leads to the English Civil War, which creates friction between loyalists and parliamentary fractions of English territories in the New World. So we're talking about in 1560 CE to 1590 CE, um, many, many English territories are thriving during this period. But in 1640 CE, we're seeing um, these English territories start to deteriorate because of English tension uh, within England due to the English Civil War, which you need to know about because their maritime holdings were kind of kept at, from a from a statistical standpoint, um, you know, on hold. And they weren't really expanding maritime or establishing new territories in the new world. So next we have from 1650 to 1750 CE. Um, in 1650 CE, there was a huge religious war called the Thirty Years' War, and the Peace of Westphalia was signed. Um, and the France gained the rest westward territory of Alsace-Lorraine in western France today, which really increased their imperial might because the more territory a country gained, the more viable it was to produce a maritime empire. And that's exactly what they did during this period. Uh, next, we see 1710 CE, Germany's triumph in the War of Spanish Succession leads to the transfusion of French territory into the hands of the English, further fueling England's emergence as an imperial superpower. Um, so because of the War of Spanish Succession and the transfusion of French territory, England becomes an imperial superpower and it's able to kind of put this money and territory towards its expansion into the new world and the maritime realms. And next, we see in 1720 CE, the Qing Dynasty bans Christianity. So if you're talking about the Qing Dynasty, Pratham, I can't give you much information about the maritime improvements that happened there, but the Qing Dynasty did bid ban Christianity, and that did uh, kind of signify them as an anti-maritime empire kind of region because they didn't want a lot of influence from Christianity, and they didn't want a lot of trade occurring between these both these regions. 
So the Qing Dynasty, along with the um, Tokugawa Shogunate in Japan, were really, really secluded empires. They were isolationist and adopted isolationist policies to prevent Westernization and maritime trade. And in 1760 CE, trade in the Qing realm, as we were talking about earlier, was limited to the port city of Canton, bringing forth heavy maritime trade that in return inflated the Qing economy. In 1800 CE, and sorry about that, I actually mixed up the Qing Dynasty with the Tokugawa Shogunate. Um, I know the Tokugawa Shogunate did allow trade in only one spot, but I do forget that spot. But do know that the Qing Dynasty had only trade in Canton um, to bolster their maritime trade. But in 1800 CE, as the Portuguese Empire spearheaded efforts to establish a trading post empire between West Africa and East Asia, other European entities established realms of influence in India and Southwest Asia. So the Portuguese Empire was kind of making a good note in this huge landmass between India um, and, you know, and West Africa and East Asia. Um, and like the British and the French were really, really zeroing in on Asia and India because that was their main territorial offering that they, that they wanted to capitalize upon during this period. So um, without further ado, let's kind of go into some case studies with different maritime empires. Do you guys have any questions about the history of maritime empires, how this kind of came about before we go into some case studies? Yeah, any questions you guys have, um, any clarifications you guys need. If I need to go back through a couple slides and explain some things, do let me know. I'm very happy to be able to do that. So I'm just looking for any comments you guys have. I and mean, also, if I'm going too fast, let me know um, because I am trying to kind of pace myself during this, uh, this stream. So if I'm going too fast, let me know so I can prove uh, that for you guys. You guys have a few minutes here to answer um, or ask any questions. All right, so if we don't have any questions, um, we'll move forward with the case studies. If you guys have any questions that come up uh, as we're speaking, um, we will make sure to answer them. And as Eric Breckman said, any of the details could be evidence. Um, yes, for the Qing Dynasty, any of the details could be evidence of uh, their overall technological improvements. Um, and yeah, gunpowder with the Qing Dynasty. But here we go. So the case study of the Portuguese Empire. So why was the Portuguese Empire so important and so influential during the age of maritime empires? Um, it's because of the position on the southwestern coast of the European continent, because this position made them very, very close to Africa and very, very close to Asia through this a lot of straits, um, naval straits. So it really helped them with regard to their overall location. And they have strong will leadership that was very religious. They're uh, under Roman Catholicism and they had a technological technological prowess. Sorry for my pronunciation there, but it set the stage for such discoveries because the main thing to know about this is uh, the Prince Henry School of Navigation, as we mentioned earlier, because Prince Henry School of Navigation was so, so, so phenomenal because this school allowed for further advancements on the part of sailors, navigators, map makers, and such people in general. Uh, we have Diaz and da Gama, first of all, as the first thing that happened with Portugal. So there's a guy named Bartholomew Diaz, which uh, he was financed by Prince Henry the Navigator and the Portuguese federal government. And he actually made a voyage uh, across the Cape of Good Hope, which is in the southern tip of Africa, as you can see in this map. But he went across downwards from Portugal to the Cape of Good Hope and across this kind of region. Um, and he explored the western coast of Africa to the north and um, the south, the west and the east. He really explored this kind of um, cape and the western advancements. And he led the way to the expedition of Vasco da Gama. So Vasco da Gama actually completed uh, Bartholomew Diaz's voyage. And he went from the Cape of Good Hope to the maritime um, city of Calicut. Calicut is actually a city in India. And that was our main goal of Bartholomew Diaz. And Vasco da Gama was the first to make this huge expedition, which led to greater expeditions by later explorers um, during this period to kind of get to the riches and the spices in India. So next we have the Treaty of Tordesai. So as we're seeing here, there's two big preeminent empires that wanted to take a territory um, of the maritime realm. And it was Spain and Portugal, the two empires that were discussed and we're talking about naming the empires. Kudos to you guys for naming these empires. They're the first pioneers of the maritime empire's realm. So in 1494, the Pope actually drew a longitudinal nine dividing their territories. Uh, it's called the Treaty of Tordesai, and it's called the, you know, the territorial line. Um, and this proclamation led to much of the new world being taken by the Spanish. And they had no idea this was so much territory because the Pope is kind of just drawing this line based on random. 
uh, randomization, personal whims. We drew this line, and this line gave the Spanish a huge, huge, huge amount of territory um, in the New World, and most of the territory was theirs to keep. Obviously, other people like the British and French and the Russians challenged their own jurisdiction of this territory, but the Portuguese did get to keep their trading post empire in Eurasia, um, and they also did get some territory in Brazil, which allowed them to kind of gain territory and to expand their maritime empire. And the Portuguese maritime empire as a result was kind of limited to their trading post empire. And the trading post empire was kind of a a set of um, seas across the coast of Africa, coast of East Asia, the coast of Malacca, and all of these trading posts, they were kind of rests for uh, for voyagers and for sailors and for traders, and they spiked up costs for people to trade goods. There were kind of a, a ruling economy which made costs higher for people to buy goods and people to sell goods, a taxation-based economy because of these trading posts in these empire. Um, and also we have a guy named Cabral and a guy named Magellan, as he later Portuguese explorers. Uh, Cabral is a very, very uh, little known um, explorer in the Portuguese realm, and he actually discovered the territory of Brazil, which was the only New World territory of Portugal that they actually owned during this period, so it's very important to know that Cabral did so. And also Magellan, Ferdinand Magellan. Yeah, I guess you guys have heard this name. I'm sure you guys have heard this name. But he did lead a voyage that, after he was mutinied and he died, um, he did lead this voyage that led to the overall um, you know, circle around the world by the Portuguese entities, his own crew. And the Portuguese were the first to do so, as followed by English explorers. All right, so our next case study here is Spain. And I think the reason for Spanish exploration is kind of self-evident here. But before I do go on, um, do you guys have any questions about Portugal? Any specific events you guys would like me to mention about Portugal? Um, questions about why they were important, what these, why these events were important? please do let me know. I'll give you guys a few minutes to ask any questions here because Portugal is a huge, huge, huge maritime empire that can provide a good example for later empires. So any questions, any at all, uh, do let me know. I'm here to help. Yes, and Mr. Beckman just said, um, not to my knowledge, Cabral's voyage was described in the passage used for one of the practice as they used last week. Um, and if you guys do want to practice SAQ, I would recommend, um, if Mr. Beckman links this document, recommend this uh, this reviewing this voyage. Because Cabral's voyage, again, uh, the Brazilian territory was just Portuguese, big, big territory in the New World and how they profited. Because Brazil was a great um, plantation-based economy, and they got a lot of stuff from this empire. So next, we do have um, a case study of Spain. So as I said, the reason for Spanish um, preeminence during this period is kind of self-explanatory because they actually had just defeated the Moors when in 1492, they you know created expeditions under Christopher Columbus and later explorers. And they were kind of the really successful people before the English in the New World because they established so much, much territory because the treaties to Wanasai and how much territory they got. Um, so the what happened with them was they had a king named King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella who unified the entirety of Spain under as a Roman Catholic state. And because of this, um, they just, you know, kind of banished the Islamic Moors from Spain. And they were high, kind of on a high um, of religious ethnicity um, and a nation state that was very, very uh, committed to nationalism and religious, uh, just religious pushing religion, pushing God, pushing glory in the new world. And because of the Treaty of Torosai, um, later on, they inspired, they, you know, subsidized the voyage of Christopher Columbus, who accidentally journeyed westward and opened up new opportunities into the new world. He actually thought he was going to, um, to Asia. That was his original vision. He wanted to go westward to get to Asia, which wasn't really, he kind of, uh, vastly misjudged the overall uh, scope of the world because he thought the world was much smaller than it actually is. And because of this, he was kind of um, kind of in the blue here and he ended up making a voyage to the, uh, to the West Indies. And then inspired by Christopher Columbus's voyage in the Treaty of Tordesai, um, we see in 1510, uh, um, Juan Ponce de Leon explored Florida. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I try my best. <laughs> but uh, Ponce de Leon explored Florida and he established um, a Spanish realm in Florida. And he also, and Vasco, well, yeah, he established a Spanish realm in Florida. And Balboa explored the bulk of Central America, looking westwards in the Pacific Ocean in the name of Spain. So because of these early discoveries in 1510 by uh, Juan Ponce de Leon and Balboa, the Spanish gained huge, huge, huge territories in Florida and in Central America. 
And last, we have the conquistadors, which are incited by the successes of Pizarro and Cortes in the mid-16th century, because under uh, Francisco Pizarro and Hernan Cortes, the Spanish Empire conquered territory in the Incan realm, um, and the Incan realm and the Aztec realm, which is huge, the hugest empires and actually in South America. So the Spanish were getting territory in North America, Central America, South America, they were really everywhere during this period. And that's just how much of a big realm they were. And conquistadors began even after Pizarro and Cortes to emphasize the Encomienda system, La Hacienda system, and the Incan Mita system. So that's just things they used, but we'll go into this a little bit later um, we're talking about different systems that the conquistadors used. And then lastly, our, our last case study here, we're missing the English, which didn't really establish a heavy base in the New World, uh, but we do have the Netherlands, or the Dutch, as many people like to call them. Um, and I think the main impetus for the Dutch, you know, creating territory and trading post empires across the world internationally um, was to expand their religion and to expand their overall trading post empire. Because the Dutch, when they declared independence, they established themselves as a huge Protestant base. And for any Protestantism, French Huguenots, Protestants, they all came to the Dutch Netherlands to establish their own supremacy. And even the pilgrims came there first to establish their own free realm. And the Puritans, many Puritans came over there. Um, and it established itself as a trading superpower with Amsterdam in the Netherlands and many empires in the New World, just to kind of you know show their importance. And uh, a quick digress here, um, Mr. Beckman just linked the SAQ prompt. So, I mean, feel free to refer back to that presentation to kind of get some overviews uh, of the main tenets described here. All right, so the Dutch East India Company, that was the Netherlands first joint stock company. And I wanted to mention to you the Netherlands and the Dutch were very, very big on joint stock companies. And what joint stock companies are is when you know people, investors pull their money together to finance expeditions over to the new world. And the Dutch were very, very, you know, relevant and competent and just they use joint stock companies so, so, so often. And so the Dutch East India Company was determined to discover a Northwestern Maritime Passage um, across the New World to Asia. And the Dutch East India Company sponsored and inspired westward voyages, especially by Henry Hudson, who discovered the Hudson River in uh, modern day New York and established the uh, Dutch territory of New Amsterdam later on. And um, the second thing the Dutch had was the New Netherland Company. And this was kind of made to complement the Dutch East India Company as another joint stock company. It was established in 1614 and made a profitable fur trade in the New World. Um, but this fur trade was kind of short lived because the Dutch had a small presence of traders in the New World. And they were established um, later on as the Dutch West India Company. So as you can see, a main trend here is trading post empires and also these joint stock companies. So lastly, we have the Dutch gambit, the main thing that the Dutch had going for them. Um, so the Dutch actually, they conquered Spanish holdings in the West Indies in 1634 in response to growing Native American attacks in North America. So they didn't really want to diversify North America because their fur trade was being attacked, but they did want to have a plantation-based holding in the West Indies. And that's exactly what they did. So they expanded their maritime empire to what they needed to do, and they established these joint stock companies, which really made their maritime empire successful. Um, so to give you guys a brief overview to characterize these different realms, the Portuguese had a trading post empire that was mainly limited to Asia, especially um, the Asia and Africa and the Western coast, the Strait of Malacca. And they also had the Treaty of Tordesillas, which kind of limited their realm only to Brazil, the New World. The Spanish, um, they were very, very religious. They really, uh, you know, operated on these three platforms that you learn about in world history very, very often. Um, and we have God, gold, and glory. He just wanted to spread the Roman Catholicism. They wanted to spread their own glory, and they wanted to spread their wealth. And that's really how they operated here. And they had conquistadors to do so, and people like Christopher Columbus, this pioneer, this revolution. And the Netherlands, the Dutch Netherlands were very, very important in maritime empires because they established this main concept of joint stock companies later on. So let's talk about next... Um, the emergence of maritime empires after Eurasian development during the early modern period. Because in the course CED for this course, you guys are going to want to kind of focus on the Afro-Eurasian developments. Because again, it's not just all Europe. There's many, many mar maritime empires in these other regions um, and gunpowder empires as well in that regard. So the main concept to learn from this period is within the African continent, European entities began to embark on extensive trade missions aimed at procuring valuable metals from the continent, especially in places like the Kingdom of Congo um, and uh, 
the Swahili realm and the Ashanti realm, they had very valuable metals like gold and silver and things like this. And they traded it with the Europeans for salts and, you know, usually random things. And they just established a huge, huge, huge trade here along with the slave trade um, and a missionary. They had a lot of missionaries, the Europeans in Africa. Um, and so that was a very, very influential kind of thing. And European nations began to develop strong connections with well-established African nations, such as the Kingdom of the Congo and the Ashanti realm, especially the Portuguese established a huge connection with this realm. Um, Portuguese, Spanish, many, many, many empires, including the English, exported their resources and slave labor for the New World. Because as we're going into the New World, these encomienda system and this chattel labor, we're seeing native populations decimated. You know, it's, it's very, very... Um, it's hard to kind of comprehend how many Native Americans were killed because it's just like so many millions, thousands of Native Americans were killed by the Europeans. And that's why they really relied upon the slave labor um, from Africa and this continent. And the Portuguese also established a major port city in Goa off of the western coast of India and established a major trading post empire running through the Strait of Malacca. Uh, as I said earlier, the Portuguese were very, very heavy on Asian trade and the trade between these trading posts. And that's why um, they were so keen upon developing such a trading post empire and trading between different places during this, uh, this realm. If you guys want any more knowledge about trading post empires or um, any the Kingdom of Congo, the Ashanti Kingdom, please do let me know. I'll give you guys a few minutes to ask any questions. Uh, comments, add anything to this lecture. And I see Mr. Giorso, Mr. Beckman helping me out a lot here, linking some expansion, like good presentation for you guys to review after the stream. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot of great things we have here today that can help you guys. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about some more Afro-Eurasian developments. So in coherence with their institution of sea beggars to raid lacking Spanish settlements, the Dutch conducted major raids on Portuguese ships and trading posts, establishing itself as a major trading superpower. So um, I didn't mention this before, actually, I'll mention it right now. Uh, the Dutch, they really established their maritime realm by attacking segments um, of the Spanish, the Spanish um, Empire. Because the Spanish obviously had many ports in the New World, they had many ports in Africa and things like that. Uh, so what they did was they instituted sea beggars. And these sea beggars were kind of people who went out. They were kind of like pirates and they established their own Dutch territories right next to these Spanish or um, later on these, port, these, uh, these Spanish and these uh, English territories and they really really uh, tried to attack these territories and make them their own and that's why the dutch empire was such a trading superpower because they wanted to establish their own realm in these english and these spanish territories um and establish itself as a major trade superpower because these sea beggars and this violence that was recurring um, within these territories you know conquered by other realms England and France also developed trading posts in India following this major trend. So the English East India Company um, and the French trading post empire was actually establishing major trading posts in India, uh, which is actually a good thing to know because India was actually conquered in, in full by the British East India Company later on. And this kind of is a predecessor to such an involvement, but they did have a lot of trade with the spices and different you know, kinds of things that were occurring during this period in India, um, in Asia for that matter. And also note that both Japan um, and China remained virtually off limits during this period because we're trying to stress their isolation and stance. Uh, they did not want people to come and to impede upon their territory, to gain their territory, and to make them more westernized. Uh, and so we just want to recognize that Japan and China were very, very isolationist during this period. And they were not maritime empires. They did not like maritime empires. Uh, that was just their stance. All right, so some of the major you know, labor systems that emerged during this period were, first of all, chattel slavery. Um, and chattel slavery was very heavily used in the New World. If you guys haven't talked about chattel slavery in your AP World History modern classes uh, so far, uh, chattel slavery is actually an extension of modern day slavery or uh, more like Civil War type slavery, where slaves were treated as property. And they were kind of, it was kind of a European led form of slave, slave labor centered around the concept of slaves as everlasting property that you never lose. And you can do basically whatever you humanly want um, with no restrictions. And that's just how it was. I think it was the most brutal form of slavery. 
um, uh, you know, during this period, that's in my opinion, but it was a very brutal form in any regard. Um, as were any of these systems. The encomienda and hacienda systems were mainly used by the Spanish conquistadors, um, and they're very sharply different, but somewhat the same. The hacienda system was similar to modern day plantations, and the encomienda system stressed stratified social order and intensive native labor. Because what happened was the Spanish empire actually contracted uh, different segments of land towards Spanish conquistadors, who got also native laborers to kind of work this land and to produce an agricultural importance of this land and that's how they got their work done. They contracted these native laborers who were giving them for, for free, and they used these estates to kind of establish plantation-based economy in the new world. And we also have indentured servitude. So indentured servitude is how countries that didn't really emphasize slavery brought people over to the new world. And how it worked is basically a person who was coming over the new world would finance the voyage of a servant over to North America, South America, Central America. And because of this, the servant would have to serve for a you know designated amount of time, usually 10 to 20 years uh, for this landlord. And this provided them with a temporary source of labor, which didn't really compete with slavery until very, very later on after the abolition of slavery in many regions. But industrial servitude was a way for European entities to kind of both encourage uh, and stimulate migration over the new world and also to um, establish labor and temporary labor to work, work about in the new world. And finally, we have the Incan Mita system. And this is kind of an example of the Spanish adopting, or the European superpowers adopting old types of labor. And the Mita system was actually adopted by the Incas to kind of control their population and to allow for the population to provide them with their labor needs for roads, for the infrastructural canals and things like that. So the Spanish adopted the Mita system to constrict individuals into mandatory forced labor, which obviously the surviving Incans really accepted because they really had no choice under their former overlords, uh, which were the Incans, uh, the Incan government, which the Spanish really kind of tried to emulate through the, their adoption of the Mita system. So if you guys have any questions about the Mita system and Netra servitude, uh, want me to repeat my descriptions of the Encomienda Hacienda systems or the Chateau slavery system, please leave it in the comment section. I'll be glad to answer them. Um, I'll give you guys a few minutes to kind of relay your thoughts about this. All right, so without further ado, let's go on to the long-term effects um, of this early modern period and the maritime empires during this period. So first of all, we see slavery lead to a host of political, demographic, and cultural changes as African kingdoms gain a seat of prominence in um, important trade networks across Europe. So because the Congo kingdom and the Asante realm, they really had a major prominence in the metal trade, in the slave trade during this period, they established a heavy connection with uh, the European entities and the Middle Eastern entities during this period. Period. So the main importance that you're going to see from slavery is the African kingdoms gaining a much, much more intimate connection with the European empires, which we will see in the Europeans' big graph of territory in the next period. And then next we'll see uh, European pressures upon formerly isolationist nations, and we're talking about China and Japan, will eventually break. And, uh, you know, through the opium wars, as we'll talk about later on, and the Meiji Restoration, Ch both China and Japan will become everlastingly more westernized and become, you know, much, much more open and westernized nation in future years, uh, which is one of the long-term effects of their isolation in this period, how rapidly they modernized. Um, and also we see the Colombian exchange start to take root, and it gives way to the dispersion of disease, religion, foods and crops, animals, and et cetera. And it allowed for a demographic growth in population in Europe and a demographic depletion in places like Africa, and especially the new world, because millions of natives were killed by these European diseases that transfused over to the new world. And finally, uh, let me get back to the slide, we have European diseases. And I like to stress this as the most important effect of the maritime empires and the maritime age of exploration during this period. And it's just because these European diseases lead to a virtual decimation of native populations in the new world, while native crops lead to a major population growth in Eurasia, because when we're having potatoes, maize, stuff like this go over to Europe, it's a major population growth, which becomes a staple of the population. But then when we have diseases like um, uh, we talk about, you know, the yellow fever. Um, we talk about uh, the influenza. Many of these huge diseases like smallpox and things like this really decimate the populations in um, the new world and lead to a native uproar um, under this guise. 
So that is kind of my overview of the whole Maritime Empire's realm. I will be going into SAQ practice and a multiple choice question practice, but I do want to open up the floor for any questions as we go here today. Um, please ask me any questions that you guys have, and I will make sure to answer them as we go forth. But yeah, um, leave in the comment section, ask a question in the question bar. Okay, so if there's no more questions in the chat, and you guys can keep on asking, by the way, as I present this, uh, we'll be going into a D, an SAQ, a document analysis um, of this excerpt. So I'll read it out loud for you guys to analyze here, um, this excerpt. So world history historian Sanjay Subramaniam quoted in Smithsonian Magazine 2007, the Portuguese drive was not simply to explore and trade. It was also to deploy a maritime violence, which they knew they were good at, in order to tax and subvert the trade of others and to build a political structure, whether you want to call it an empire or not, overseas. So that is a very short excerpt that we're going to base our SAQ upon. So do you guys notice anything with regards to historical importance, um, intended audience, purpose, point of view? List out anything you see from this document, the main idea, the main gist of this document, the sourcing structures of this document. And thank you so much, Paige, for watching this. Um, I'm glad to help in any way possible. You know, I was in the same state as you last year. Um, I was falling behind in my class, but I really caught up with Five Bowl and the mentors that we have here. And it's just so much valuable information. So I'm glad that you're using this platform and it's helping you out because that's the goal we have here. But if you guys do want to kind of tell us about what you see from this document, uh, the different tenets, the sourcing of this document before I go into it. And yes, if you guys enjoy the stream, um, Paige, definitely go to Donald's stream on Wednesday because it's kind of a continuation of my stream. And it kind of is my stream plus Gunpowder Empires. So it's kind of a supplement of the stream. And Mr. Donald DiOrto is a great teacher. Um, I'd like to emphasize that. So definitely make sure to go ahead and, you know, pressure for that stream. Okay, so let's go into the hippo analysis of this document. So historical importance. Um, we're talking about the Portuguese trading post empire and their maritime empire during this period. And the intended audience, I think it is usually people who are reading historical accounts and modern people. So it's not really likely to be containing much bias on the part of the author. Um, and the point of view is kind of to inform the audience. The purpose is kind of to tell the audience about how uh, the Portuguese really stressed um, taxing and subverting the trade of others because trading was their main goal. They weren't trying to convert people as much as they were trying to trade is the main standpoint of the author Sanjan, Sanjay Subramaniam. So he really stressed how they're trying to expand their own realm um, and to expand their own uh, money, to expand their own wealth, and to expand their own maritime importance and their empirical realm. So here are a few of our SAQ questions we'll be asking. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to bring up, here we go. All right, so the first SAQ question, the first SAQ prompt is to identify one example that supports Sobranium's argument. So if you guys can please, please, please comment your answers in very, very short. Um, make sure to go into just one example that supports Sobranium's argument and we'll discuss your answers. And that's how I'm gonna structure this practice SAQ time as we go here. So please, please, please make sure to uh, leave your viewpoint, your own answers to this document. So this SAQ answer A. We got a few minutes to do that here. Because I mean, practicing these SAQs is like ingenious. Because I mean, doing so, if I practice SAQs this early, I probably would have done much better. Um, and I just think it's very, very important for you not to cram for the exam and to practice like this. So be interactive, uh, be engaged, and do participate in this, you know, this activity. So for all of us that are joining now, um, I would like you guys to identify one example that supports Subramayan's argument in this excerpt. So I'll give you guys a few more minutes. Please, please, please 
Um, one specific example of the idea is a passage that constitutes one point in the SAQ. Uh, so make sure to, you know, try your best. Give me one sentence answer. Um, it can help you guys out. So. All right. Um, so one example that I see from this document is the Portuguese trading post empire, because that really consolidates Subramanian's part arguments in this statement, because Subramanian is talking about taxing and subverting the trade of others. And that's exactly what the Portuguese trading post empire was. And that's a great example, because the Portuguese trading post empire was really focused upon taxing the ships that go in um, and, you know, taxing the people who were transporting goods out. And that's how they made their money. And they used maritime balance to kind of establish these trading post empires beyond uh, local resistance. And you can really bring that up. You can talk about how the Portuguese trading post empires were used and how they were used to build a political structure, um, which may not have been an empire in traditional forms, but was an empire of the Portuguese. So uh, without further ado, let's go on to our next prompt. Explain what, explain, again, it's not just identify, it's explain. I explain one example that challenges Subramanian's argument. So just explain one example of Portuguese expansion and the impetus for expansion that does challenge the way Subramanian has um, implemented this. I'd like you guys to answer this one as well and to think about, you know, what was, what were the Portuguese doing? Why did they do, why did they expand um, and how is this different from what Subramanian was saying? How is it different from exclusive expansion based on taxing and getting wealth? So please, please, please comment about something that challenges Subramanian's argument, a difference with the Portuguese empire per se. All right, so I'll go ahead and answer this one for you. Um, so Mr. Beckman says, for B, an answer would be Portuguese doing something different for a different reason. So what Subramanian is really emphasizing here is the Portuguese only uh, expanded for wealth and monetary benefits. So if you guys can just highlight one thing that Portuguese did um, that wasn't, you know, subsidized or caused by their own, um, tech, you know, wealth-based initiatives something that was different for them. Why did they do uh, things that they did other than wealth? The other reasons for their expansion. If you guys can list that out, just one thing. That'd be great. All right, so one thing I caught right off the bat um, is religion. Because the Portuguese were actually, if you guys remember, were Roman Catholic. And they stressed Roman Catholicism in everything that they did. And as with many empires like the French, the Spanish, and the English, uh, they were very, very keen upon spreading their religion, Roman Catholicism, um, even in the midst of you know wealth and things like this. Because that was their main focus within such a, such a drive. Okay, for C, explain one change in European overseas expansion in Africa and Asia in the years following, you know, 1750 CE. So how did European expansion, the way in which they did so in Africa and Asia, not the New World per se, but Africa and Asia, excuse me for that, um, change from, you know, this period to after 1750 CE into the next period, if you guys know anything about this. So please, 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 I would really love it and appreciate it if you guys leave your answers in this comment section. Uh, I do see a lot of newcomers in today's stream. Six of you guys are new. So definitely capitalize upon this opportunity because this is what, this is what we're all about here at Fivable, uh, getting people to answer questions and getting you guys to learn. So a few more minutes for you guys to answer these questions.
All right, so if you guys want to have an answer for this question, um, basically what I want to put for this question is that the European um, overseas expansion during this period was kind of limited to trading post empires and kind of not this physical, um, this expansion of territory and kind of just establishing these small little places uh, that where they could garner taxes and garner wealth from. But after this reach, after this realm in 1752, later on the modern period, we see many, many, many um, traditional empires and these empires kind of forming um, on the maritime realm, but also having a land based influence. And I don't know how to describe this kind of per se, but I would say something like the Roman Empire having much, much, much more territory than having a Portuguese trading post empire or a Dutch trading post empire, but just consolidating so much territory um, after 1750 CE, much like a traditional empire. So um, those are my answers. Uh, I, you know, if you guys want to answer any of them again, or give me alternate perspectives, I would love that. Uh, but you know, yeah, it's, it's optimal for you guys to answer these questions. So uh, I do want you guys to start answering them in, the, in future sessions. All right, so a practice multiple choice question. Um, this is the excerpt, the little art we'll be using for these multiple choice questions. Um, it's actually made by Jacob von Morse. Uh, Amsterdam receiving the tribute of four continents, the front piece of the historical description of Amazon, Amsterdam in 1663. Um, tell me what you guys notice. There's a lot of stuff going on in this image, and I do want to hear what you guys notice from this image. So definitely talk to me, you know, tell me about what you guys see. If you guys are just joining us, I'm trying to get you guys to uh, label out what you guys see from this image. I think this is a great MCQ prompt if you guys are trying to learn from uh, the multiple choice questions and how to answer these questions. And Mr. Beckman said, I see a lot. Uh, that's a great way to start it off. You do see a lot in the very middle there. Um, and you see many, many, many animals in this, this little picture, which is talking about Amsterdam. Um, and we see the horse for animals. We see the cheetah. And we see many animals trying to make an influence in this picture. Because, again, Amsterdam was a very, very, um, you know, culturally inclusive realm and a very trade intensive realm. And we see many, many animals make their influence, especially in New Amsterdam during this period. Uh, we see uh, the king over there, um, the, I, I expect the Netherlands king. And we also see the slaves sitting on the bottom kneeling. We see a slave standing up. We see camels for other animals. And we see many, many people from different origins. I do see a Muslim trader, I do believe, and just East Asian traders that are kind of influential during this period, um, especially to emphasize the overall cultural inclusion and the connectivity of this realm. And camels obviously were from the Trans-Saharan region uh, and just animals from different regions were convening upon Amsterdam. So without further ado, let's begin our multiple choice questions here. So first of all, uh, which of the following provided the most relevant context for the image? A, independence of the Dutch Republic secured after the 30 years war. Uh, B, military threat to the Protestant Netherlands from Catholic France. C, rivalry with the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean. Or D, wealth generated by state chartered monopoly companies. So answer the question based on what you see um, and what you know from history. And again, Donald Orto said, I see angels. Um, that's a great answer because angels were kind of, kind of giving them a religious emphasis to explore and to kind of, uh, you know, bolster trade during this period. So answer this question, A, B, C, or D, um, and leave your answer in the comment sections. Because multiple choice questions are a very integral part of the AP examination, so uh, it'd be essential for you guys to kind of practice this in today's session. So any of you, um, please go ahead and answer this question. Page says a D. Um, We'll see about that in a little bit. Uh, we'll get anybody else to answer these questions. Thank you, Paige, for answering, by the way. All right. So without further ado, the answer is D. Uh, D is the correct answer for this question simply because state charter monopoly companies were kind of a trademark of the Dutch. As I talked about earlier, we have the Dutch VOC or the Dutch West India Company, and we have the you know Dutch and New Amsterdam Company. It's a very, very great influence of these state charter monopoly companies, and that should have been a 
you know, huge indicator for you, uh, but also because Amsterdam was established by the Dutch and also wealth was heavily generated by these monopoly companies. Uh, and it's just, you can see so much wealth. You can see the, the silver, the ribbons at the very top. You can see a ship in the very background. You can see the king who's lavishly dressed and very, very um, integrated culturally. We have a lot of things going on in this image. We have a very lavish lifestyle for this king. So you can say a lot of wealth. You can say monopoly companies if you know anything about the Dutch. So I do appreciate you answering, Paige. That's a very good answer. All right, so the next question is, historians could best use this image to illustrate which of the following. A, the Dutch East India Company is using military force to enforce its spice trade monopoly in Southeast Asia. B, Dutch West India Company's profits from traffic, trafficking enslaved people from West Africa to the Caribbean. Uh, C, pride felt by many people in the Netherlands due to the riches provided by their empire. And D, the variety of responses by people in Africa, the Americas, and Asia, and Dutch imperialism. So if you guys get interested in this question in the comment section, A, B, C, or D, once again, And these are fresh questions. Mr. Beckman wrote them yesterday, and they are very, very fresh. So if you guys have any comments about the questions, make sure to reach out to him as he just laid out in the comments. So answer this question, A, B, C, or D. Paige just said B. Any other answers for you guys? All right, so the answer is actually not B on this question, but the tricky part about this question with a lot of AP questions is that you know all these answers are correct. A is correct because they did use military force, but this is very distantly seen in this image. Uh, B is also correct because we can see enslaved slaves in this image, um, and these slaves were kind of a tenant, a kind of an integral part of Dutch expansion. Um, and D is also kind of correct because we have a variety of responses um, in Africa, the Americas, and Asia, and Dutch imperialism. But the answer is definitely C. As Mr. Beckman said, the title is Amsterdam receiving tribute from four continents. But the main thing we can see from this image is that it integrates all of these aspects. Because if we're thinking about it, um, slaves are a form of riches. Um, you know, we see different fruits in this image. It's a form of riches. So we see angels, which kind of represent royalty. We see royalty in and of itself, the Dutch king. And we also see um, many slaves. We see many animals, which are just an important, an important part of the Dutch influence and the influence of many, many parts of the world upon the Dutch because of their trade. And I just think that, you know, housing all this information is this great, great, great image. Um, and, you know, uh, I think all the answers are correct, but C is the most important and the most, you know, the most relevant to this image because it utilizes all of these and makes it into a one correct answer. So if that clears it up for you, Paige, I can explain it more for you why it's not B, but it's essentially because enslaved people from West Africa can be seen in this image, but C is a better answer. Um, they're both correct, but C is just simply a better answer because it convenes all of these things, and especially because of this title. And our last question here is, which of the following expresses a way the Dutch Empire differed from the Spanish and Portuguese empires? So A, military conquest in Africa, the Americas, and Asia. B, profits from valuable commodities. C, prominent role of joint stock companies. And D, the use of forced labor to produce trade items. So if you guys can comment on this, uh, A, B, C, or D, uh, use your power knowledge from the uh, Dutch Empire, as I mentioned earlier, to answer this question. Good luck. Yes, the incorrect answers will be some similarities and not differences because this question is kind of based upon uh, similarities, a comparison kind of aspect, because what you're going to see is only one answer is really differentiated uh, within the Dutch Empire as differentiated from the Spanish and Portuguese empires. And you should be able to see it fairly easily. As I mentioned about the, the Dutch Empire earlier, so make sure to comment what you think the right answer is. So A, B, C, or D. Any answers to this question? I'll give you a few more minutes here to answer this question.
All right, so the correct answer for this question um, is actually C. Um, and it's because the Dutch was a very, very intensive empire upon joint stock companies. And the Spanish didn't really have a joint stock company that prospered. And the Portuguese West India Company literally lasted for like 155 days or something very short like that. But the Dutch were heavily relied upon a wide variety of joint stock companies. And I think that really differentiates the Dutch from the Spanish Portuguese empires. And that's what you guys should have chosen for this question. Um, if you guys didn't, please let me know. Uh, military conquests in Africa, the Americas, and Asia were achieved by Spanish and Portuguese. We see, uh, you know, especially by the Portuguese, you should know that because they were a trading post empire in Africa and Asia. And then uh, the profits from valuable commodities. Um, we see all these empires, really, maritime empires, profit from valuable commodities, and all these empires use forced labor. So uh, I do think C is the best answer here for you guys, and it's a very, a fairly straightforward answer. All right, so that ends my stream here today. If you guys do want to ask any questions, uh, feel free to do so because the point of me being here is to answer y'all's questions. I think the main things that I've been answering questions for in the past few streams is my own experiences as an AP student, kind of how to study for the AP examination, and also uh, different content-based topics. So please feel free to answer questions, ask questions. Um, I will be happy to answer them. So we'll give you guys a few minutes here to answer these, ask these questions so I can get ahead and answer them. I appreciate all of y'all joining today's stream. I think it was a very um, helpful stream, an informational stream, and I really hope you guys to join different streams like this and save your spot for um, Mr. Diorto's stream, Mr. Beckman's stream later on. So yeah, ask any questions you guys want uh, about my life, about my experiences, about anything in general, AP World History, the Dutch, the Portuguese, And yes, Mr. Dorto just posted Jamal's stream and a link to that. Um, I think that's going to be a great, great stream for you guys because Jamal, I've worked with him before. Um, he's a killer student. He's a stellar student, and he knows what he's doing. So taking notes from him will be a great, great tip for you uh, because it can really help you out in the AP World History curriculum and just benefiting from him. So if you guys want to ask any questions, uh, I'm here to answer them for a few more minutes. Minutes. All right, so I will move on. Now, judging that we don't have any questions in the chat room. Um, okay, so a quick plug to Fiveable. I would like to mention that we're uh, on our socials for Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Think Fiveable. And make sure to follow us to get me updates about upcoming AP World History streams and different streams in AP subjects, study skill streams, things like that. I think it's a great resource. Uh, we often post replay content and material, some of them in our YouTube. So definitely subscribe to our YouTube. And if you want to get connected with Fiveable, if this is your first time as a learner, uh, definitely get connected with us. It's a great stream uh, strategy and tool for performance come May. Because as you're doing this, you're going to get more information from, you know, from your lectures, from lectures here, and it can really help you out come the AP examination in May. Uh, I would like to plug myself. My Instagram is vkartathala on Instagram. So follow me and we can probably connect. We can talk about different AP subjects uh, and let me know about what where you guys' flaws are at, where you're trying to learn from in AP World History. Um, Fiveable also has an intercom service on their website, so you can contact me or any other great AP World History teachers or students through this intercom service. So definitely go on the AP World History Fiveable website and type in your questions or comments if they don't come to you today. So I really appreciate you guys joining today's stream, and I hope you guys join Jamal's stream um, and Mr. Beckman's stream and Mr. Donald Dortra's stream. I'll go back and back to all of those really, really quick here just so you guys can have a visual for that. All right, so here we go. Here's a big visual to show you guys the upcoming streams. But yes, I really appreciate you guys coming here. Um, thank you guys for joining my stream and I hope to see you guys later on with Fiveable. Thank you, have a great day.